Welcome to Megan in the Thunderdome, a citizen assembly meeting where we test ideas and hone debate skills in a real life social political arena with the goal of holistic balance. If you'd like to participate, find out how in our podcast description. So let's begin with a round of introductions from our panelists. I will start us off. My name is Megan and I am currently in San Antonio, Texas. And my fields of interest have to do primarily with restoring the family as the backbone of society. I'm also interested in proper education, homeschooling, and proper nutrition as well. I will now ask Stacy if she could introduce herself. Hi, I'm Stacy Gustafson. I split my time between Northern Michigan and Southwest Texas, and my main focus is holistic community problem solving. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stacey. Ramses, would you please introduce yourself? Hi, sure, Megan. Uh, hello, my name is Ramses. I'm joining from Montreal, Canada, and my main interests are logic and human rights. Great. Thank you, Ramses. Daniel Tweet, would you please introduce yourself? Hey, gang. I'm Daniel Tweet. I'm a recurring candidate for city council here in Thousand Oaks, California. And uh, I'll be at the Rotary Club Street Fair on October 17th with a booth. And I'm the founder of Thousand Earths Cupanomics, which is a way to make our species multi-planetary and regenerative. Thank you. Super interesting, Daniel. Thanks for being here. Daniel Bader, or Dan Bader, would you please introduce yourself? Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, coming out of Chicago. Um, I uh, retired from the Chicago Department of Public Health in 2016. My areas of uh, interest are public health, mental health, uh, abrupt climate change, and uh, bioweapons, biowarfare, vaccines and this COVID-19 situation. And that obviously these days absorbs a lot of my mental energy. Thank you for being here, Dan. And last but not least, Cesari, would you please introduce yourself? Hello everyone, Cesari Urevich uh, from USA. And I'm joining you from the outskirts of Chicago. My main interest as a thinker is animal liberation. Oh, well, ethics, animal liberation, economics, social and economic justice. Thank you for having me here. Thank you for being here, Cesari. That completes our introductions and we will move on to today's presentation. I'm going to be presenting my idea, which is part two of the raw meat diet, the healthiest diet on the planet. And today's topic is bacteria is your best friend. So this idea has been written up to share with others in agora-ilp.org. This idea actually is not in Agora yet. It's going to be compiled as one idea with all three parts at the end of this presentation, which we will continue into next week. But Agora is basically the worldwide stock market of ideas. And you can find it at agora-ilp.org. And it's an online platform where people from around the world can turn their ideas into policy, share them with others, and help build a better world. So I will go ahead and screen share, and we will begin with the reading of the idea. Okay, already miss, what can I get for you to eat today? The waitress asked me politely. I will take the 16 ounce ribeye with no salt, no seasoning, and I would like that raw, please, I responded. Raw, she asked, uh, okay then. Then two minutes later, the chef appears and he says, so I take it, you want a raw steak? I nodded. You don't want it seared, blue, maybe even a little cooked. No, sir, I would just like it raw, please, I responded. So he gave me a look like I was out of my mind and he walked back to the kitchen. But within time, dinner was served and I enjoyed my raw steak. It was on Mother's Day with my mom. And sure, I was a conversation piece among the restaurant, but I smiled to myself as I ate because for my food, I received something that nobody else in the restaurant obtained in adequate abundance, and that is bacteria. The 18th century philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau stated that all problems arise when man strays away from the pathway of nature. For in nature, there is perfection. 
Raw food in its natural state contains the perfect amount of nutrient ratios, enzyme structures, and bioavailable bacteria. However, when we put our food into fire, we destroy it. Studies show that the following nutrients are reduced during the cooking of red meat. So the water soluble vitamins like vitamin C and the B vitamins. Um, and then also the fat soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K, K2. Then the minerals, which is potassium, magnesium, sodium, and calcium. So in addition, cooking food also produces a plethora of toxins. So according to the National Cancer Institute's heterocyclic amines, I'm going to call them HCAs and PAHs are chemicals formed when muscle meat, including beef, pork, fish, or poultry is cooked using high temperature methods, such as pan frying or grilling directly over an open flame. So in laboratory experiments, HCAs and PAHs have been found to be mutagenic, which means that they cause changes in DNA that may increase the risk of cancer. So they produce carcinogens essentially. So when we put our food into fire, burn it and stray away from nature's pathway, we are bound to face a plethora of problems, such problems that lead to chronic illnesses of all sorts. So did you know that humans in nature have been eating raw foods loaded with bacteria since the beginning of time? In fact, some tribes even consume fermented meats known as high meat. And it's called that because the high concentration of bacteria and parasites makes you feel amazing, like a high feeling. Um, of course, these foods contain, yeah, an abundance of bacteria. And one example of this that actually still exists today is the Chinese 100-year-old egg. So in the 20th century, researchers such as Weston A. Price, who wrote a book called Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, and it's a study of the primitive peoples. Also, I don't want to butcher his name, but I'm going to call him Stephenson, or Wilhelmer Stephenson wrote Cancer, a Disease of Modern Civilization. So he compared the rates of cancer that exist in the modern world to the uh, cancer in the primitive peoples or among them. So both researchers study the diet and lifestyles of the primitive peoples like the isolated Swiss, the isolated Gaelics, the Eskimos, the Okinawa, the Hadza Bushmen and more. They all discovered a common theme. Every tribe ate an animal based diet with a mix of cooked raw and fermented foods. Very few plants were consumed and when they were consumed, most were cooked to kill some of the uh, anti-nutrients that are naturally found in plants because they also release protection mechanisms because they don't want to be eaten. So yes, you produce toxins when you cook, but you also um, release some as well from plants, for example. So though, though the primitive peoples do not shower regularly, wash their hands with soap and water before every meal and consume foods practically infested with bacteria, they live free of disease and in peace and harmony with one another. Now, on the other hand, in the crazed modern world, which is far removed from nature, where people shower daily, they sanitize regularly, and they consume predominantly cooked and processed foods, the citizens are facing a crisis of chronic illnesses. In the United States alone, nearly 36.5% of adults are obese. Every year, about 647,000 Americans die from heart disease, which makes it the leading cause of death in the United States. Is it possible that the cause of disease could be as simple as the very foods that Americans are putting into their bodies, the way it's being prepared, and the absence of our beneficial bacteria? So let's talk a little bit more about the importance of bacteria. So as I mentioned above, bacteria is naturally present in all living things. You can't get around it. It is the origin of life. So by nature, life is designed to consume life. Humans are the only animal on the planet other than those they've domesticated that consume cooked and processed dead foods. When you put something into fire, it dies. Humans and the animals they've domesticated are also the only beings on this planet that are chronically ill. Every other animal in nature consumes a, a species-specific raw foods diet as nature intended, and because of this, they too live disease-free, unless they are exposed to modern environmental toxins or something. So we know, as the study showed us earlier, that cooking damages food, and it's also obvious because anything you put into fire will be damaged, but how damaging is this? So let's look at pasteurized milk, for example. So pasteurized milk is milk that has been heated to extreme temperatures to destroy the dangerous pathogens, so to say. 
Well, when milk is heated, one of the essential digestive enzymes called lactase is destroyed. Now lactase is present to facilitate the digestion of lactose, which are the milk sugars. So with the absence of lactase and other bacterial agents, lactose becomes harder and harder to digest. So people become lactose intolerant. Now, if these same people would drink whole raw milk, they would seldom experience any major digestive issues. So a couple studies show some interesting information. In 2011, a survey of 56 Michigan raw milk drinkers found that 11 individuals claimed that they experienced symptoms of lactose intolerance when drinking processed milks, but had no ill side effects from drinking raw milk. In 2014, a survey of 153 Maryland raw milk drinkers, 59 respondents claimed no discomfort after drinking raw milk, but discomfort from drinking pasteurized milk. So what is it that makes a difference? bacteria and active enzymes present in uh, the milk's natural raw form create a almost perfect digestion. Now, what a lot of us don't realize is that more than 90% of our body is made of bacteria. Some people say 90, some say 99. I tend to go more towards 99 because it's about 90% of our cells that are microbial, which is based solely on the number of bacteria in our guts. But we also have bacteria in our hair, all over our skin, and pretty much everything else on us and in us. So most of the body's functions are bacterial, meaning they're performed by bacteria, including the digestion of our food. So when you consume foods that are naturally abundant in bacteria, you are nourishing your body on a cellular and a bacterial level. Since most of the body's functions are performed by bacteria, ingesting more bacteria helps your body function more optimally. This is why the primitive peoples are so healthy and don't have disease. So when a piece of cooked food is eaten, it is already deficient in certain nutrients and bacteria. Now this puts your body into a state of shock because without the presence of bacteria and the food to facilitate digestion, the body is forced to digest the food on its own without the help of bacteria. Now, in addition to that, the carcinogens that are produced from the cooking of the food also poison cells so the body is actually forced to leach nutrients from healthy cells to nourish the now damaged cells. Now, when this process is repeated over time, we have cellular degeneration and cellular degeneration within time will result in diseases of all sorts. So it's important to recognize that disease doesn't just mean heart disease, cancer, disease, if we break the word down, it is dis-ease. So your body is in a state of not ease. So this could show up in common colds and fevers and maybe a chronic cough, anything. Disease can be anything that takes you away from your uh, natural state of ease. Now, I do wanna mention that there are of course other toxins that poison the body and cause disease in addition to cooked and processed foods. So we have of course, environmental pollutants from factories, radiation poisoning, EMFs and more. But the unfortunate truth is that modern society lives in a toxic world and consuming a diet and whole raw foods is more essential than ever uh, before for obtaining optimal health. Because if we're eating whole raw foods, they actually promote cellular reproduction, this is proven, and they nourish our bodies. So when we are being destroyed, you can at least repair the cells in your body if you're consuming whole raw foods. Most people don't do this, which is why they degenerate over time. So wrapping it up, in the early 1900s, a researcher named Dr. Antoine Beechamp proved that germs were not the cause of disease, but rather they appeared as a result of disease in the body. So Beechamp discovered that bacteria are created from small granules of life that he called microzymas. And in his own words, these were the organized yet living remains of beings that lived in long past ages. They are the transmitters of heredity. Within the chromatin material of the human sperm are contained all of the microzymian granules needed to genetically reproduce all the different cells essential for the reproduction of the human species. After many experiments and microscopic examinations of these granules, Beecham's research proved that microzymas were capable of developing into common living organisms that we call bacteria. Bacteria and parasites work in symbiosis with the body actually feeding on dead cells and waste to eliminate toxicity and help us formulate renewed healthy cells. This is similar to how flies appear when garbage is left out, bacteria appears to clean up cellular waste. So like flies, bacteria are not the cause of disease, but or, or gar the garbage, I mean, but they are more like the janitors who come to clean the mess up. 
Uh, contrary to Beecham's research were the speculations of Louis Pasteur, who the founder of modern medicine and the infamous germ theory, which is really nothing more than that. It's just a theory. The belief that pathogens form spontaneously and cause disease has never actually been proven, but it's been accepted as the official scientific theory, which is in practice today. Now on his deathbed, Pasteur denounced his research, stating that the cause of disease is not microbes, but rather the environment in which they feed on. So we ended up coming to the same conclusion as Beechamp did. They were actually rivals at the time, pretty much. But this information was, of course, ignored by the press and never released to the public. After all, there is much profit to be made through medication, pharmaceuticals, and hospital bills, much more than would be made if people followed their natural diets. Now it's important to know that disease is not something that is caught, it is created within the body uh, by toxic environments. On the bright side, the inverse is just as true, that we can create healthful, happy, and disease-free lives for ourselves, our families, and for the generations to come by choosing to consume whole raw living foods with a plethora of beneficial bacteria, nature's best friend and our greatest helper against disease. Now, last thing I wanna say is that this information goes against everything that you've been told since you were a child. You see a raw steak like the wait staff at the restaurant I was at on Mother's Day, and you watch in awe as I eat and enjoy the grass-fed ribeye, thinking to yourself, is this woman crazy? And maybe I am, or maybe I'm onto something. You know, I believe we should question everything we hear and formulate a personal philosophy of our own based on our own intellectual understanding of the world and how it works not necessarily what someone or some institution has poured into us. So it boils down to one question that I will leave you here before we go into discussion that who should we trust more, the government or mother nature? Okay, great. We already have some hands up in the chats and we will go ahead and well, before we move into discussion, we'll just take a a vote to see who is in general agreement with the philosophy of this idea that bacteria is our best friend. Okay, awesome. Ramses, okay, cool. Stacy and Dan, is that a full hand up or half? Okay, you're on mute, but I think. Uh, yeah, I was giving you three fourths. Okay, awesome. Okay, cool. I'm excited to see too the research that you guys have learned since the last time. So I take it that usually Daniel is kind of, uh, Daniel tweet is kind of in the middle. Is that right? 40%. Okay. And then, okay. Got it. Okay. 40. Oh, I see in the chat. Cesari is either abstaining or not in agreements. Okay. I take it he's abstaining. And then Joy, um, I know last time you just wanted to listen. So that is totally fine if you want to do that. But um, if you'd like to participate, then feel free to jump in. I'm listening. Okay, awesome. Well, if anything changes, just uh, put your hand up and we will go to you, but okay, great. So we'll go ahead and move into discussion. Now, if I'm correct, Stacy is up first. Yeah, so I really, really want to uh, believe this and I understand the idea that whole uncooked foods are healthier and contain more light life force mm -hmm. but um it says that the native americans cooked their food cooked their meat into stews and stuff have you looked into that mm -hmm. yes great question i will we'll all address that super quickly before i go to cesar yes so they do eat it actually a mix of cooked and raw foods the primitive peoples that are here today are not the same that we're here thousands or millions of years ago. They have had some kind of influence into modern civilization. So that's how cooking has passed down. But they still do eat a good amount of raw and fermented foods as well. And I really, I would recommend that to the average person. It, I mean, I think it's not the worst thing in the world to eat some cooked foods as long as you do have an abundance of raw foods in your diet as well. If you can do all raw, great, but yeah. Okay, Cesari, you are up next. So that was interesting. Uh, very good presentation uh, with some interesting materials. Uh, and I mean, I've heard that 
raw food is good for you. Uh, so that's why I eat raw food sometimes when I feel like it, when I want to. Um, the problem is I just really, really don't care. Like I, I, I just eat what tastes good. Like that's, that's my priority by far. If it tastes good, I'm going to eat it. Um, if it doesn't, I don't care if it's cooked or raw. I'll eat it because it tastes good, you know? Um, and of course, you know, uh, but I'm not talking about animal products because I look at them as, you know, products of violence and, and oppression. So that's off the table, uh, just really just for ethical reasons. Uh, but this, But this whole thing about bacteria I, I think that's actually kind of fascinating because you do provide like a kind of a I don't want to say compelling case but very interesting position that maybe like the whole all of science is kind of like wrong in, on this and that's not really like it's not really that far-fetched as it might be there is like a lot of things that people have taken you know as proven that just they later found that it was all wrong. So this whole idea, like, uh, you know, the, the causation versus correlation, you know, with bacteria. I mean, it's kind of making me scratch my head here, but I just really don't care all that much. Like, this is something I, uh, you know, the Veritasium, I really love the Veritasium YouTube channel. I think his name is Derek. If he did a video about this, I'll definitely watch a video about this. But again, I, I'm not like gonna research this. So, uh, but I, I, I guess the, the one thing that it, I am thinking about is why haven't animals, I guess some sea animals have done this, but why haven't like land animals evolved like poisonous, like poison uh, type? Why didn't, why, why aren't their bodies poisonous to eat like certain, uh, and I guess some animals are that way. Like there are certain like frogs. If you were to eat that frog, it would it would mess you up. But uh, there are a few animals that have toxins in the, in their bodies. But but this makes me wonder: why didn't more animals e evolve like toxic? What are the, I don't know what they call them, like little nodes or something. They glands, maybe glands, like toxin glands, so that other animals don't eat them. Like seriously, like when you think about it, wouldn't that make sense for evolution to go that way? Uh, I'm gonna stop here and I'm gonna think about what else. I'm gonna say later. I yield. Thank you. Okay, great. Interesting points, Cesari. Uh, yeah, I respect your open-mindedness a lot. So thank you for that. Next, we'll go to Daniel Tweet. Yeah. Hi. Um, you could actually view bacteria as being at the top of the food chain because let's face it they eat everything <laughs> and everything eats them so they're they're kind of at the midpoint of a circular food chain perhaps uh, but in my view evolution is a very comprehensive uh patterning regenerative system and it it does things that that uh, contractors do it designs it builds it operates and maintains and evolution is trying to do that on a very comprehensive scale so it's now at the point where the biosphere could actually replicate itself beyond the earth and we could become multi-planetary cosmic enlivened species. And, you know, the dinosaurs had about a hundred million years to evolve and do this, but an asteroid got them and wiped them out before they could have a space program. We, on the other hand, have a space program. We can avoid the fate of the dinosaurs. And that's what evolution is driving us to do, in my opinion. And, um, Prove me wrong, <laughs> I yield. All right, great, Daniel, thank you. Uh, we'll go to Ramses next. Um, so first of all, very nice writing. Thank you so much, Megan. I like the introduction. Um, so I looked up uh, the theory of germs. Uh, so if you don't mind, I'm, I'm just gonna share the headline. Sure, um, uh, of course, I don't agree uh, or disagree with this, I just wanted to know your opinion. Okay, so Wikipedia is claiming that 
and this theory is, is a currently accepted scientific theory, which they call germ theory of disease, which states that the pathogens or germs can lead to disease. And it says a, a germ here might, may refer not, uh, to not just bacteria, but to any type of microorganism. And finally, of course, uh, the Arab editors uh, will want to show that they are superior to all other nations. So they have inserted references to Ibn Sina uh, in a, a, a year 1025. And of course, this shit, like I'm, I'm not gonna rely on Ibn Sina in order to prove a scientific uh, a theorem, you know, in 2021. However, just wanted to know, uh, of course, it's, uh, uh, the article references a lot of recent research, uh, but just wanted to know your opinion on this. Sure, so I am up next, so I will go ahead and answer. Was there anything, um, I know you pointed out a couple of things, but were there any specific questions that you wanted me to specifically address from that? Uh, yeah, so you mentioned that uh, uh, there was a theory developed uh, in the beginning of last century, right? And it is a germ theory as well, but it states exactly the opposite. It states that germs do not cause uh, diseases. But now the, it sounds like as a scientific consensus is uh, uh, that, you know, um, according to the article, is that germs actually cause diseases. And so what do you think about this? Uh, how, for example, if I'm researching, for, if I'm searching for the truth, uh, what should I do? Right, okay. So I'm looking at the, the Wikipedia article now. So um, yeah, a lot of the information that is out there is false or it may be partially true, but it may be misconnected. Um, when it comes to the truth, honestly, what kind of sold it for me was now the science to me, I, I, yes, it is important to talk about and to address, but what really got it for me was just looking at what exists in nature. So when I figured out that in nature, they literally eat raw meat, of course they do cook. Well, okay. In nature, nature, they wouldn't cook, but primitive tribes today do cook some foods and all the animal foods and they're extremely healthy and live disease free. And then I look at modern society that eats a plant-based diet that is processed and cooked it just, to me, in my head, I'm like, okay, intellectually, I don't even need to know the science. It just makes sense that this is of nature and this is what's most beneficial. So that's pretty much what I have to say on that. What I really have to do is actually dig through that article and really read it to give you a specific answer. Um, but yeah, so I see that the basic forms of germ theory were proposed back in 1025 and everything. So yes, this is an idea that's been around for a while. It was it was pretty much in the 1900s when it was funded. And Pasteur was funded by a lot of people above him, such as the emperor of France, because they really wanted to push this idea uh, because the medical industry is one of the largest financial industries out there. I mean, think of this. If So if we agree that, um, or if it becomes true as uh, people collectively agree that the germ theory is flawed, the entire medical industry changes and would go down which means that also the pharmaceutical industry would go down, which also includes supplements and things like that. So I guess my belief is that the germ theory is something that is used today largely to um, it's prof for profit and control. So I would take those points into consideration. Did I answer what you asked? Uh, yeah, Megan, thank you so much. Okay. Okay, great. So after myself is, Let's see. Um, I think Ramses again. Are you you are up? Yeah, because I had another question to Sadai. Um, so um, my question here is: instead of killing animals, uh, last week we, uh, sorry, the week before last one, we discussed uh, waiting for the animal to die, uh, and then eating their flesh. And the argument was that their flesh is gonna be eaten in any ways, you know, if not by us, it's gonna be by the world. Uh, so it is a kind of mercy uh, if we eat them. And at the same time, 
it's our biological type in general. So all in us, you know, like we are just eating ourselves. And this applies to humans as well, uh, like humans eating humans. Uh, so I'm wondering uh, if, if you consider this as ethical, because you as a vegan have your ethical stand, uh, have your ethical reasons not to eat meat. So just wanted to know what you think about this. Thank you. Okay, great. I will answer that really quickly and go over to Dan. So what I think about that. So, okay, on the topic of humans eating other humans, is it ethical? Well, morals and ethics, was that the question? So it was to Cesare. But, oh, okay, okay. but please, yeah, but, but you, you, please, I, I, I would like to know your opinion as well. Okay, yeah. Um, okay, so the way I look at it is morals and ethics don't exist in nature because no other animals have them. There's something that we create in our own mind. They can be beneficial. So I wouldn't necessarily want to kill and eat the people I love in my life and in my family. However, if I'm in nature and uh, my family or my tribe comes across another opposing tribe and they kill some of the tribe members, sure, that's probably some of the best nutrition you could get. That's kind of the way I look at it is it's also similar in nature too, to where um, I don't think lions would, you know, kill members of their own family, but if two opposing lion prides come across each other and fight, they will fight to the death. Do they actually eat the other lions? I don't know, but I think human nutrition would probably be the, one of the best uh, things for us. In fact, if you actually look into it, I know in, um, in Germany, not even a hundred years ago, you could go into certain health food stores and buy human body parts. It was just normal. So I think it was the same thing when people died, they would just sell their different body parts because back then they understood that, oh, if you have some kind of ailment, like liver issues, eat a human liver and it actually works to repair. So it's kind of the way that I look at it. But um, anyways, on to Dan Bader. Um, so I, I have some thoughts. Um, you know, again, I, I want to add uh, in, I, I thought you, you, the write-up was really good. You know, is really is you were told really well done, um, and and I do think that uh, you know you you've made um, a valid argument in terms of the nutritional value of raw meat as opposed to other nutritional products, and but of course in in reality there's huge problems with um, eating raw meat uh, because the supply of meat is a problem right away, unless we're going into humans. Um, there just simply isn't enough meat to really go around uh, in, 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 you know, cooked raw, period, plus they are getting ready, they meaning those who control the levels of uh, levers of power are getting ready to remove meat pretty much from a dietary option, whether it's cooked or raw. And, and it's also a lot of people have um, a sentiment very similar to Cesare's, you know, where um, you should let to, to some degree, these animals alone, that it's very brutal, of course, butchering them and, and the slaughterhouses, et cetera. Um, so, you know, there, there's a context and, um, uh, you know, there's pros and, the, and then there's, you know, some cons in, in, in terms of, uh, so, so for example, if you were recommending to somebody, Megan, you were saying, here, the, the, I, want you, I want you to try some raw meat. I think it's a good idea. Here are the pros. And then you would also tell them some cons. What would you say would be the cons, the things that they would have to watch out for in terms of raw meat consumption? Great points, Daniel. I look forward to responding to those. I appreciate that, uh, that you brought that up. So, but before myself, we're going to go to Cesare. So I'm actually eating an apple right now. Not really to make a point. I just really wanted an apple. It just seemed like that. They're, they're good. 
they're delicious and they're raw. And actually, this is yeah, I was thinking about all this raw, uh, raw food, and I'm like, well, I should probably eat some more raw food. So I do have an apple. So to answer um, Ramses's question, uh, well, yeah, I mean, sure, if you want to go around like the forest and find dead animals, then go ahead. But nobody's going to do that. I mean, come on, seriously. That's just not going to happen. So, I mean, some people might actually, some people, you know what? The other day I was downtown Chicago and I saw a dead, like a bird, dead bird that you might be interested in. <laughs> I don't know how long it's been dead on the sidewalk laying there, but no, we seriously. No, but... Uh, domestic care. So we would take care of them, you know, domestically. And when it is a time for the animal to die, we eat them instead of us killing them. So um, I look at I look at this issue on, on two different levels. Uh, one is I, I do consider my veganism to be my personal choice. Um, for, and we could discuss that, you know, there are a lot of different reasons for that. But I do consider that my personal choice. It's not something I expect of everyone or I demand of everyone. What I do demand of everyone is animal liberation. And this is really a matter of just, uh, it's really a matter of politics and uh, uh, ethics and politics. I just simply don't trust anyone who, is, who holds animals captive. I just don't trust them. That's it, that's what it comes down to. I don't trust humans who hold captive other animals. Um, so I don't trust them to take care of them. I don't trust them to do anything. Just you know, leave, let, let the animals go. Th those are, that's the only thing. Um, if you want to go hunt them in the wild, go ahead. That's your personal choice. It's your animal rights to, you know, to, to go hunt uh, for other animals. Um, the other thing I wanted to say was uh, the way that this uh, proposition ended, it kind of created this kind of silly false dichotomy it's like, do you trust nature or do you trust the government? And it's funny because nature and government are actually very, very much alike. You know, the uh, nature provides a lot of things to you, but it's trying to kill you. Uh, and then your government, uh, you know, provides a lot of things for you, but it also, there's a good chance it might kill you. <laughs> I mean, I think we can kind of rein in the government a bit more than nature. And we're, we're much better off when we control government. Uh, but we're not better off when we control nature. So that's, that's different. Uh, but the uh, one other thing, point I wanted to make is the whole idea of cooking food. I, I think it's, yeah, I think, you know, and, and especially of cooking meat. Not that this is something I'm personally interested in, uh, like, but theoretic, as a theoretical exercise, I think it does kind of make sense that if people are going to eat other animals, then they would eat them raw. And, and it does make sense that naturally people, it would be healthier to actually eat uh, animal flesh raw. I think the, I mean, I think the reason that people started cooking things in general is because and maybe this is more true for plants but i think people started cooking things in order to extract greater more calories out of the food it wasn't to make the food healthier it was actually to get more energy um so i guess that's really the reason why people cook food and so it probably makes sense that this uh, these extra calories come at a cost that they denature some other um nutrition that other than calories but but i don't know how true that is for plants versus animal foods um i, I think it, it's it's more plants that lose their nutritional value when you cook them but then you get more calories out of it but i don't know if the same is true for animal foods if, but it sounds like it would be from but maybe it's not as much as with plants so I don't know. I'd be curious, uh, curious to hear Megan speak to that. I yield the floor. Thank you. Yeah, great point, Cesare. I definitely look forward to touching on that as well. Before myself, we'll go to Stacy, and then Daniel tweet is after that. But take it away, Stacy. 
Okay, it seems to me, I, I really wonder why did, if it was really that we're meant to eat raw meat, why did we start cooking things? Because that was clearly before uh, Pasteur and our government. And I wonder if it isn't because um, in our creativity, we began combining ingredients and it was really, really tasty. Like the Native Americans combined their meat to make stews and stews are awesome. And then um, you spoke of, uh, when we were talking about cannibalism, well, if you run into a tribe, then you have to kill them and why not eat them? And I think hopefully we're moving into another era where we're not just running into people and going, I have to kill you to survive my tribe, but that it is the survival of the the whole universe and is killing this this other tribe to save my tribe what the universe wants. And I don't know. I'm just kind of against cannibalism. I don't. I don't see a way that that really works. And um, I, I. I also agree that keeping animals for meat is never humane. There is no way that you can take care of animals the way that they really need to be taken care of. And I say that from being a person who kept a, a hobby farm. It's just impossible to keep them healthy all the time. And the mistakes that I made were really, really painful for me. And I, I believe what we should do is in Texas here, we have land that is ag exempt if you allow the neighbor's cattle to roam on it. We also have an enormous number of deer and wild pigs. And if we adopted in the areas where it's safe that your neighborhood just says, all right, guys, this is our neighborhood and we're going to let the cows and the deer and the pigs roam. And a few of us are hunters here and we'll keep the neighborhood supplied. I think that is a real legitimate way to supply meat to our communities. And lastly, um, I wonder about, I, I really want to eat less cooked food, but when I take something out and reheat it, I'm really into leftovers. I understand I have to cook it to 165 degrees to keep those um, bacteria when we've been trying to make it last longer in the fridge um, to make it safe to eat. And so I just thought I'd throw that out there. I, I keep heating it up too much and I wonder how to do leftovers correctly. Thank you very much, I yield. Okay, great points and great questions, Stacy. I look forward to responding to those as well. Uh, Daniel Sweet, go ahead. Hey, yeah, thanks. Great conversation, actually. Um, okay, a couple points. Uh, first off, I think uh, we all need enzymes, which are crucial for life, but uh, when you have a prolonged um, dry heat above 117 degrees Fahrenheit or a prolonged wet heat above 150 degrees Fahrenheit, it destroys or deactivates enzymes. But I think, you know, if you had some fresh meat and you just killed it, it would be really tasty. But after it sat around for a few days, it would be pretty disgusting and you wouldn't want to eat it. So I think, you know, there wasn't always raw meat, fresh meat on demand. So cooking served the purpose, more of a preserving uh, way to, to concentrate that protein and make it available between successful hunts and kills of raw meat bearing foods. So that's one point I would make. Um, the second one is uh, bacteria is really essential to the development of civilization. Most people think that agriculture started so we could make grains and uh, make bread and that led to civilization. But there's new evidence that says people were collecting wild grains and the wild grains got wet and made beer. And then the beer actually spurred the development of uh, agricultural uh, stationary civilizations. In fact, there's like uh, ancient pictures, you know, people making beer and bread. Uh, and the, the beer has actually found to predate the making of bread. Plus it provided a social lubrication <laughs> that, that literally made people more interested in cooperating. And um, so that's a second point. And another kind of tangential point, um, which I heard recently, but it relates to the foundation of civilization is that the sociopathic personality types <laughs> may have been crucial for uh, the foundation of civilization. Um, namely in things, ideas that like, oh, my bloodline is so great. You gotta like have my bloodline be in charge from now on. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that was you know, clearly a departure from a meritocracy based uh, civilization. And um, 
there was one other point. Um, oh, yeah. I so sorry since I misquoted him when he said that government and nature are alike uh, because they both give you stuff, but also are both trying to kill you. And he says I misquoted him, but I, I'm pretty sure I got the gist of what he was saying. So I would offer him the floor to correct uh, the gist of what, what I said. That's it. I yield. Thanks. Okay. So before I go ahead and uh, Cesare, would you like to correct anything? Or we summarize? Well, I mean, they're not, I mean, I did say that they are a lot alike, but I wasn't saying that the government's trying to kill you. Obviously, it doesn't make sense for the government to try to kill you. Um, no, it's just that, that very often it does. <laughs> but that's, you know, yeah, so obviously there are differences. Well, yeah, nature may not be actively trying to kill you, but very often nature ends up killing you. Whether or not there was an intention behind nature wanting to kill you, <laughs> it doesn't really matter if you're dead. There are parts of nature that are actively trying to kill you, but not so much parts of the government, like no parts of the government. Right? Well, what about evil mm -hmm. slaving governments like a third of the world lives under? They're more likely to kill you. Yeah, so there are sometimes government does that, but in general, that's not what it's trying to do. And it would be an interesting topic for some future discussion. <laughs> Honestly, I'm so down for that. I'm going to write that down to like do that here because I have so much to say on that. Well, okay, one thing I want to say really quickly is there are totally parts of the government that are trying to kill you. We're literally experiencing a genocide. Side, uh, as we speak now they're doing it really creatively because we don't actively see people dying like happened in the holocaust we see people dying in other ways through poor nutrition and poor health there are many many aspects of the government that are trying to kill us things like uh, chemtrails also advocating plant-based diets and fake you know beyond meats um keeping people shielded away from nature yeah the government is totally trying to it's not, not necessarily trying to kill people so much as it is to enslave them and make them ill. And um, yes, okay, nature in general actually promotes uh, survival, survival of the, honestly, the fittest, not to be Darwinian or anything, because I don't agree with a lot of his philosophies, but it makes sense that the strongest, most intelligent beings do survive. So um, yeah, of course, if a lion sees a human, now, actually, there are videos I've seen of lions running away from humans and like tribe members. So we, we often forget that we really are at the top tier. And um, but it, I guess I think maybe it depends on the consciousness you operate. But OK, um, before I go okay. into actually answering. Yeah, I'm going to go to you, Daniel, and then I'll go into okay. answering the points mentioned. But Daniel, go ahead. OK, one thing I forgot to mention, uh, we, we talked about um, how we're mistreating animals and we're holding them captive, but actually you could house the entire human population in the state of Texas at just the pop, at just the density of Tokyo. So we know that Tokyo is not a terrible place. So imagine if Texas was nothing but Tokyo, the whole rest of the world could be wild habitat. And, uh, you know, we're really being greedy in the way we're using the land surface and the water surface of Earth. Uh, you know, we're not the only species out there. And there's a great book called Edenicity that proposes you know, a more a more dense, uh, integrated way of living that would leave immense habitats available, and we could commute between the population centers with hyperloop vehicles, and that's a very viable thing. We should really consider it. It's part of my platform, Dan Tweed for Thousand Oaks, 2022 City Council. Great points, Daniel. That actually leads into the next point I wanted to make uh, to answer the question: Is there enough meat to go around? This is something that Dan Bader brought up. I totally believe that there is. And also, I don't buy for one second that the world population is what we're told. I don't believe at all it's 7.8 billion or whatever it is it's at now. I think it's way less than that, maybe even under a billion. I don't know the exact number or answer, and maybe it doesn't really matter because there's no way you would actually meet everybody in the world anyways. But they've essentially just grouped people into crowded cities. So it looks like there's so many people around, but that actually, when you go out into the rural areas, it's very, very different. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know if there's, I can't necessarily prove to you that it's less than 7.8 billion people, but it's just a personal belief based on my understanding. And I mean, also feeding people meat is way more efficient than feeding people plants because meat is way more bioavailable. You get way more nutrients per calorie anyways, because 
Yes, we eat for calories, but also we eat mostly for nutrients. Even a person who is 800 pounds, I would still consider them starving because clearly they're eating so much because they are lacking essential nutrients. So that's what our body seeks is nourishment. One cow could feed an entire family for, I would guess, three, four, five, maybe six months. So two cows a year per family. Uh, maybe that's depending on the size of the family. But I mean, that's actually great right there. If, if people live spread out, they lived on even two acres of land and they have like, they could easily survive. It'd be way better for the environment versus plants. You have to grow many, many acres of plants and you have to eat such high volumes of them to feed people. And also the fact that they're not our natural diet and we don't even have the apparatus to digest them, the bioavailability, meaning what we actually, not what we ingest, but what our body actually processes is very minimal. So in summary, I do believe there is plenty of meats to go around. Now, like Daniel, um, or Dan mentioned that our government that I do believe is trying to harm us is going to be issuing food shortages and increasing the price of meat. It's already happening as we speak. We might see something like hyperinflation, but what they're trying to do is make it really hard for people to be independent and also to be healthy. So this is why meat prices are going to be going up. And in that case, people who don't have financial means or don't have a way to get it may suffer from that, unfortunately. So that is also happening. Um, so it's something to actually really think about and prepare for. That's another thing too, is um, talking about the argument of animal liberation and how it's the best thing for animals. And I can agree to that, Cesari, that the best thing to do would be to go hunt animals in nature and then eat them fresh. I mean, that would be awesome. Now, is that always realistic? No. And I, I can't, you know, uh, what is the harm of having your own animals? Now, I haven't actually done that yet. I'm going to, but yet I haven't. And Stacy mentioned she had. So I'd be curious to learn more about what were kind of more the fallbacks of it. I know you can't keep every animal healthy and happy all the time, but we sure can try our best. And in a case where the government completely raises meat prices to its absurd, and we say we have some kind of nationwide food shortage, to me, it makes sense to have your own supply of food, whether it's goats for milk and eggs from chickens. Like you could, if you needed to in survival times, you could be very healthy off of just milk, uh, milk and eggs. So for that reason, I think regenerative farms are really cool. And even visiting them too, if you haven't ever been to one, uh, yeah, to really meet your local farmer and learn about what they do. It's farms, the way I look at it, are almost like safe havens for animals. So they're actually safer on a farm protected than they would be in nature where they're vulnerable. Now, that does sort of interfere with the process in nature. So there's more arguments that go into that, but that's just my uh, thoughts on that part. So cons of eating raw meat. In terms of health, there's really none unless you're eating toxic raw meat. So I've talked about this before, but if you eat a toxic animal, then like, like a grain fed cow that has been exposed to antibiotics or like you find a dead raccoon that ate trash from the city and you eat that. I mean, I wouldn't recommend that because that animal is going to be filled with toxins. And then in tune, in turn with that, you would actually get the toxins. So let's say that actually you do have um, toxic like meat that could potentially be toxic. You may be better off cooking it because you would kill some toxins while then adding more toxins. So it's like a catch 22. But overall, if you are sourcing your meat well from local regenerative farms where the animals eat their natural diet, so cows eat 100% grass, um, chickens are raised on the pasture, same with the pigs, then there really is no cons as long as the animals aren't exposed to toxins. Vaccines can also be toxins too in the animals. Now, if you are going to eat raw meat from the grocery store from a grain fed cow, you will be okay if you eat lean meat because the fat and organs are what store toxins. So if you eat meat that has no fat on it, you actually won't be exposed to pretty much any toxins. And then um, one more potential con is the social aspect, right? Because um, not many people in the world do eat raw meat. And so your friends might think you're weird. Uh, so if you can, if you do eat raw meat and you have family and, and a spouse that eats raw meat and you can raise your kids like that, then I think that is uh, actually a really wonderful thing and a blessing. But for a lot of people, maybe that's not the reality and they might feel a little bit socially isolated if they're ordering raw meat at a restaurant or maybe they might miss out on cooking or eating meals with the family. So that one might be another con. Um, okay, other question, why did we cook? Well, uh, I don't know, actually, to be honest. I don't know why humans started cooking. 
I maybe could see to get more energy, but at the same time, raw food has more energy than um, cooked food because it has more nutrients. However, if you try it, you can, and maybe Stacy can relate because she said she did try the, the raw filet mignon. You can't necessarily eat as much raw meat as you can cooked. Uh, did you experience that, Stacy? Just out of curiosity. It is very rich. I, I would agree. You don't want to eat as much of it. And that seems reasonable. The, the portions that we eat are ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. So I found too, like, for example, if somebody gave me a 16 ounce cooked ribeye, I could eat all of that 10 minutes probably, but a 16 ounce raw ribeye that could last me, you know, two days worth of food because it's so much rich. It's richer. Now, um, maybe people needed to eat larger quantities of food at once. Like Daniel Tweet said for preservation, and maybe they couldn't necessarily ferment it because they were always on the move. Maybe I could see in that way. So I don't know. I think maybe that's another topic we could talk about is just brainstorm why, what are some reasons why people did start cooking? And last couple of things, how to do leftovers. Honestly, I don't know, Stacey. Um, when food is cooked in the first place, actually, um, how do I even actually explain this? Well, I don't, I'm not that informed on this. I can send you some studies I've researched, but for example, people getting sick from uh, milk, bacterial poisoning in milk actually didn't happen until they started pasteurizing milk. So it's kind of the same thing when people do get any kind of bacterial food poisoning or whatever, a lot of times it happens from cooked foods and it's not even a poisoning. It's because the bacterial is at an imbalance and it messes up something within your body. So how to actually do that I actually, I don't, I don't really have an answer for that. I think once you cook it in the first place, it's just uh, sort of ruined, I guess, if that makes sense. I know it's kind of a dark answer, but if I have an answer in the future, that's better. I will get back to you on that. But okay, that was all. We will go over to Dan Bader now. And I believe after that, we're going to move into closing remarks, unless anybody wanted to say something before then. But Dan Bader, go ahead. Okay, yeah. So, uh, uh, I, I, the the way things seem to be moving right now, um, and and you know, in in terms of food, it it seems very clear that um, they're going to eliminate much of the meat supply, and they're going to do it. It's going to be justified because of. The, the plan that is in place that we're going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 50% by 2030, and then zero net emissions by 2050. And meat, there's all sorts of groups who really have a problem with the consumption of meat. Um, I'm, I'm from all sorts of different ethical perspectives and, but they are determined to do that. And, uh, I think they will do that because it's a rather easy one to eliminate. And, and, uh, also I, I think that the, the, you know, one of the things when you talk about the consumption of raw meat, you're talking about the nutritional value. And I think it is important whether you get it through eating raw meat or any other food you may cons consume, you need to take supplements in order to get the micronutrients that you need to have a strong immune system. And what one of the things that uh, is, it's just so, you know, it's like what they do is they give our population here in the United States, I'm talking. They give our population essentially junk food. It's encouraged. And so, you know, it's they and they have scientists who evolve ways to give you the, you know, fat, salt, sugar, taste, so that the foods, the junk foods with very little nutritional value become addictive. And of course, uh, you know, for example, one, one of the things that I consume regularly is just a tin of sardines. You know, if I have a tin of sardines, um, that pretty much could stand as a meal for me. I'm, I probably have uh, a raw vegetable with it, but uh, it fills me up because of the nutritional value. You know, so if I eat a tin of sardines and a, I don't know, a, a 
stalk of broccoli raw. That now I don't particularly like the taste of sardines or the broccoli or, or a lot of foods, but it, it's quite clear that uh, what is pushed on us makes us sick. It makes us very, very uh, sick. We have, you know, I said, they say that 44% of the uh, millennials have got a chronic disease, which probably is, a lot of it is gonna be tied to inadequate uh, dietary intake. They make you sick. They don't care about, you know, public health prevention at all. They make you sick. And then you go to the medical industry, the doctors and the device makers and, the ph and obviously big pharma. And then they treat you for the sickness that you have from the poor diet that they constantly thrust on you. And uh, I don't know whether it's true or not, but I do see here and there, um, you, you know, things that say the very upper echelon elites who are, again, they have the levers of power right now. You know, they, they have the money and they have a lot of technical scientific know-how. And, and they and their families do not consume this junk that's put out on the public. And, uh, I, and I might also add that during this COVID-19 uh, tragedy in a way, in terms of what it's done, almost all of it unnecessary. Uh, those individuals were using the therapeutics long before the vaccines were even put on the table. They were using the hydroxychloroquine cocktail and ivermectin when it was available. You know, and I, and I remember, I, um, you know, uh, Amy Klobuchar, the Senator from Minnesota, her husband got sick with COVID kind of early on, I think, in the situation. And her husband used the hydroxychloroquine cocktail. And when she was asked about it, and, and I just bring this, you know, when she was asked about it, she kind of went, uh, well, they were giving him a lot of things. I, I really don't know whether he had it. Now, what could be more dishonest? Of course, you knew what your husband, who was pretty sick with COVID, was getting but it wasn't politically appropriate for her as a big shot, you know, Democratic senator running for, you know, who was running for president uh, to go ahead and say that. And, and our population here in the United States, and it's true elsewhere, but we are completely getting screwed over every which way. And it's, it's very, very hard for people you know, to realize uh, the harsh reality. So when it comes to the food supply and the population, I, I'm hearing what you're saying, Megan, that you don't believe that we have, I don't know, seven and a half billion. But for, for the sake of, of thinking in a certain way, assume that that is what you have, that you actually do have, say, around seven and a half billion people on the planet. The people who've got the power, these, you know, scientific, technical, you know, these people who've got all the money, the, the whole bunch of them, they basically, they believe in abrupt climate change. They think that it's real. They think it's happening. And they do desperately want to depopulate this planet. And they look at people, you know, like, for example, people consume this junk food. And, and, you know, if, if you're one of these people who um, are in the elites, you look at that and you say to your, I, I mean, and I'm, I, I do have kind of a sense, I think, of how they think, you know, and I've talked to certain people. They, they, they believe that all of this stuff confirms that people in general are really stupid and ignorant and that they're, you know, they can't even... Uh, figure out that eating all this junk food is is unhealthy, even though that's what is pushed on them on, I would say, on purpose, partly just to make profits. But anyway, going back, bringing it all back to um, the meat 
uh, situate. Oh, and and just one one other quick thing on my uh, COVID thing. It it's pretty clear right now that uh, the the mainstream media has had to start to really talk about the fact that this is a bioweapon. And and what what what's interesting about that is that how long is it going to take the population to get to be able to figure out if that's a bioweapon that we're getting infected with? Actually, what is it? What have they done to that bioweapon other than just make it super transmissible? What kinds of uh, things were spliced into that bioweapon? And when do those get activated, perhaps? We don't know. And, and uh, but so now that, you, you know, a lot of people I, I saw that maybe now 45% of the population in a poll feels that it probably was a bioweapon that leaked accidentally. They have to say accidentally, of course, but uh, it does, you know, and then you have to ask yourself the fact that they've used fraudulent testing and they're doing it, by, and, and I just want to put this, say it right now. They, right now, what they've done is because of this tremendous desire to get these, vac these so-called vaccines in everybody, they've lowered down the cycle threshold that they use on the PCR test. They've kind of lowered it down to 28. Well, when you lower it down to 28, you're not going to get a zillion false positives. All the, but nobody talks about that. The population is generally ignorant. And when they want to jack it up again, you know, which they probably will at some point a few couple of months from now. All they have to do is use the level that they've been using, which is between 35 and I heard even as high as 45. Well, when it gets to 35 and 45, okay, it, it basically gives you, a, it's a fraudulent test. They have therapeutics that are available. They made it so people wouldn't know about it or think they were no good. They basically are giving people now there's this tremendous uh, push to force everybody to get vaccinated. But just if you if it's a bioweapon, what do you think the spike protein is they're putting in your body? Do you want a bioweapon spike protein in your body? Uh, why would anybody, especially when you don't need it? And again, okay, and I finally I couldn't I couldn't control myself. I had to let it rip. Uh, but I'll go back. I'll go back to you know the the thing with the meat. I do think they're going to you know raw meat. I I you know as they like to say in their little infomercials about the Great Reset. You know you're gonna um, you can eat bugs. You can eat seaweed. You know it'll be all tasty and everything like the Beyond Meat type products. And uh, you know and also you'll own nothing. <laughs> you'll own nothing, but you'll be happy. You know, it's so insulting, you know, to look at those infomercials they're putting out. And, and so I think that, you know, unfortunately, the meat eating uh, issue, you know, is, is going to be drowned out. But I, I do agree with you uh, that uh, if, if it were, if people could know that the meat was safe and, and you really understood what you were doing, it would be uh, a healthy kind of an intake. Thank you uh, for indulging me. Thank you, Dan. I always love when you go into the, the vaccine discussion because it's so fascinating. Yeah, it's totally a bioweapon. It's just, it's a mess what's happening right now. It's really a clown show, but it's honestly a little bit interesting to watch this unfold from the outside. Um, yeah, we can only do so much as an individual or on an individual level to prepare. Anyhow, before we move into closing remarks, Ramses is up and then, yeah, we'll start there. I just wanted to comment on as a statistics thing, and that the population is much smaller than what we expect. Uh, so I remember I had a friend from Cairo who used to make fun of my home city uh, and used to say that it's too small and this kind of stuff. And one day they, they, she decided to visit and she took like a tourist pass, okay, over the beach. And after five minutes from, from the starting point of the bus, she spotted me, she, spot, she spotted me. She found me uh, on a beach who was one of my friends. And then she called me and she was like, you are on beach, right? At XYZ, I said, yes. 
And she kept saying that now you believe me is that your town is just a true room condo. Uh, so I ask her a question. What is the probability if you, if you live in New York, for example, New York City or Los Angeles or she, even Chicago, um, what is the probability is that you are gonna meet someone of your acquaintances someday randomly on the street. You don't meet them daily, right? But it happens. Why? Because we usually tend to gather around in the uh, you know downtown areas in, in the city centers. But usually if you look into the map, each city usually has its center and surrounding this center is a vast, very big area of neighborhoods, you know, which actually constitutes the, 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 the most of the space of the city. Uh, so what we do here in statistics uh, is that we, of course, uh, in, in the third world, they don't meet everybody, okay? We apply a statistical method in order to get predictions. And the statistical methods really work very well because we apply them not only in social sciences like this, we apply them in all fields of science. And it's proven, it's mathematically proven that if you have random variable, then most probably the multiplication of 32 random variables at least will yield into a normal distribution. So all what you need to know here is actually the characteristics of the normal distribution, the mu and the sigma. And from there, you can make predictions and you can make hypotheses and then apply the second methods that we know. So in my opinion, to, to claim that is the, the, the predictions that we have right now is not correct because of the personal illusions that the world is small, uh, I, I think it's kind of faulty. Like I would actually rather accept the statistics because they sound more logical and they are more objective. They, they don't rely on our personal experience. Uh, last but not least, there is a researcher, okay, that already published a paper, I guess in August, 2020, where she explained how coronavirus was developed in the lab, what it needs to be done in order to convert a coronavirus into COVID-19. And she describes a process step by step. However, the response of the scientific community was pretty silly and ridiculous. Uh, for, uh, she, she's still publishing papers, but of course, of course she has to publish the papers just online on the internet on free journals because no peer reviewed respected journal will, will accept her paper because of the way our scientific consensus is formed, unfortunately. So I might, I might be able to present her view one day and also present the response from the scientific community, which shows that scientists sometimes become horrible. And that's it. Okay, I unmuted, Miguel. Uh, thank you for sharing Ramses, interesting points. And yeah, um, that could be another topic we talk about in the future, really talking about the, the population and uh, yeah, going more into that. So great that you brought that up. Well, we will move into closing remarks now. And Daniel Tweet has some questions in the chat that he asked. So Daniel, we'll start with you and please ask your questions and share your closing remarks. Yes, thanks. I agree there are many good aspects to not eating foods that have had the enzymes deactivated or destroyed, but your whole idea that everything in nature is good and that all bacteria are good and it's toxins that cause all the problems, it's equivalent to like flat eartherism. I'm sorry. I mean, it's like, do you want to get leprosy or cholera? I mean, there are just immense bodies of evidence that, that show that there are harmful bacteria. You can't you know, put out dangerous lies like all bacteria are good. You know, that is just really a toxic thing to put into the information sphere. And I wish you would do some research, uh, go on Wikipedia, you know, just 
look at harmful bacteria article on Wikipedia, look at the bacteria article on Wikipedia. I know there's a few outliers that say, you know, they have interesting theories, but there's no body of credible evidence that supports what you're saying about bacteria and disease. So I beg you not to spread misleading information. And uh, this is really to be lumped in the category of flat eartherism and, uh, you know, other such topics. So uh, other than that, I think there is a agenda among the elites that Daniel Bader is, is correct in identifying that they want to draw down the global population by around 90% because we are not living in a sustainable or even a regenerative way right now. But that's partly, as he says, a program of manufactured consent. You know, we are being mind controlled by electronic media to consume very non-regenerative substances and practices. And I think that's probably by design. And uh, it behooves us all to become educated and informed and activist on this because let's face it, uh, we're, we're condemning future generations to terrible fates if we don't. And that's my comment for today. Thanks again. Thank you for sharing, Daniel. I will now ask Cesari if you have any closing remarks to share. Certainly. Um, well, interesting to listen to, but I do want to invite you all to uh, tomorrow, Citizen Assembly, uh, where we're going to be discussing an idea uh, that I'll be presenting. It's, uh, well, the title of it is A Simple Argument for Veganism in the Context of Human Space Exploration. And the purpose of that is to explore the four logical possibilities of what a human encounter would look like with uh, space aliens in the event uh, the, the four possibilities are that uh, the human is the vegan civilization and so is the alien one or both of them uh, or ne neither one of them is an alien civil uh, excuse me a vegan civilization or that one but not the other is a vegan civilization so uh, we're going to be exploring those possibilities uh, Actually, the title of the events that I, I put out there is uh, Interstellar Space, Don't Go There Unless You're Vegan. So non-vegans beware <laughs> before you travel outside of your solar system. Um, so yeah, uh, tomorrow, 7 p.m. Central Time in my room. Thank you. Fascinating, Cesare. I definitely might attend that. I think it'd be an interesting discussion. And okay, so we'll go over to Dan Bader. Any closing remarks to share? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, it, on, on the meat itself, again, I, I think that um, your argument of the raw meat containing nutritional value is very reasonable. But of course, as Daniel Tweet said, and I, the, the, the thing is that would ha anybody would have to know uh, that the consumption of the meat, if that's what somebody is doing, is safe. And, and uh, so I just wanna, you know, another, just inform consent, you know, if you want me to try some raw meat you know, I want it to be safe. And as I said, when I when I was a kid growing up, I used to eat raw hamburger and it never bothered me. Uh, so that's as far as the meat goes. Um, the other, I, I just want to add on to, to the depopulation issue. Um, these individuals, you know, Bill Gates, um, uh, James Lovelock, all of these very elite people who have tremendous uh, scientific uh, technical capabilities and knowledge, uh, they are assuming that the habitat for any species, plant or animal, is going to diminish very, very rapidly because of increases 
in the average global temperature. This is their premise, their assumption. It's what's behind it all. And they have concluded that um, in order for they themselves to survive in a kind of life that they're accustomed to and want, they have to depopulate the planet and then to have to set up climate controlled, self-sufficient, uh, high tech, smart cities, kind of like a Singapore, you know, a little city state and to have them located in different places on the globe. And then they're, and then they're gonna let the planet supposedly regenerate in a natural fashion for however long that takes. And the, the, the only, and, and they should be, it should be discussed. You know, the fact that it can't enter the public, you know, uh, uh, forums is, is a huge problem. And, and it's, you know, when people feel like their backs against the wall and they want to survive, uh, like, so Megan, you gave the example, well, if you have two tribes and their enemies, and one overcomes the other tribe, they might cannibalize the people. That's root survival kind of, uh, you know, culture. And that's the way that these elites are right now. They feel that the, the sand is going out of the hourglass very rapidly. And that what's going to happen is certain parts of the globe are going to become not suited for human life and, and other species. And then you're going to have these huge migrations of people up to places like the United States, Canada, you know, up in Russia, the different places where it is still possible, it will be possible longer, probably, to be able to grow food. Uh, and, and, and everything is just going to go so dystopic. And, uh, I, and, and I just think that what they're doing and, and if they're not doing it, then, you know, it's, it's, it ought to be discussed because they're pretty much laying it out there in a number of books that they write and what they talk about among themselves. And, and if, you, if you really want to get a sense of how, you know, in a way, again, just, just put in, you know, go ahead and Google or any search engine and just, you know, put in, uh, uh, you won't own anything, but you're going to be happy. And, and you'll bring up, you know, one or two of these infomercials that they were running. Uh, they, they are very, very serious. And when they say, you know, uh, they're, they're going to cut down the, the, the greenhouse gas emissions 50% by 2030. Do you have, I mean, what do people imagine that's going to do to the cost of living? It's going to be through the roof. And, and uh, a lot of things are just not going to be available that we're accustomed to having in terms of, you know, products and everything. And, and this, this is just a massive kind of a thing going on. And, and as far as democracy goes, people in our country and other places aren't being, they have really no input. And, and uh, so, you know, I, I would just say that it's, the depopulation is because they feel abrupt climate change is really ripping right now. And, and they don't know how many years really are going to be left with, with any kind of normalcy. But anybody who thinks that getting this COVID-19 vaccine and then guess what? You'll be able to go back to some kind of normal life. Even if the vaccine wasn't harmful as I believe it probably is, uh, what, what's going to happen is you're not going to go back to any normal life because they're going to, you know, take down all the greenhouse gas emissions. And maybe that's what, you know, uh, should be done, or it would actually should have been done, you know, decades ago. But that's what we're in right now. And uh, anything that anybody is thinking should be set in that kind of a context. They do want to depopulate. And, and the only way that they've ever come up with to depopulate the planet without getting unacceptable blowback, like using nuclear weapons or something, uh, is through bioweapons and vaccines. And vaccines can be essentially bioweapons. You don't know what's in it. They don't want to tell you what's in this messenger RNA vaccine. But again, I, I just 
okay, thank you. Can't help myself. Uh, and again, I, I just, you know, I appreciate, I really appreciate these forums. I, I uh, uh, am very glad to, to participate and hopefully I can make that uh, Cesari one tomorrow because it seems like it's uh, kind of building on maybe what we discussed today. Thank you. Yes, definitely, Dan. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And let's see, uh, Stacey, would you like to share your closing remarks? Yeah, thanks for another um, great discussion. I appreciate the way the raw meat diet discussion is evolving and it does take more than, um, you know, one or two stabs at this kind of thing to really understand it. No pun intended. And um, I, yes, so our meat supply is not at the point where we can eat it raw now just because it's so tainted and, and unhealthy. But I still believe, even if it is decided that eating raw meat is not natural and healthy, that our meat supply should be healthy enough to eat it raw at a minimum. And uh, I look forward to the next one. And Cesare, your uh, topic tomorrow night does sound great. So thanks, everybody. Awesome. Great point, Stacey. I agree with you. And Ramses, anything you'd like to add to your closing remarks? Uh, well, I would say it was an awesome talk. Uh, thank you, everybody, um, and great information. Um, sometimes I know that sometimes I talk like a Jewish, and sometimes I talk like Christian. Sometimes I talk like an anti-Muslim. But in fact, I, I guess everybody knows that there is an atheist guy inside of me that's always telling me to only accept evidence. Okay, that's why I don't believe in conspiracy theory. Conspiracies have been there, you know, since Roman Empire. But as long as you can provide me with uh, an evidence, you know, that a, a tangible evidence that I can look at and understand that there is really a process going on, then in my opinion, uh, it is just conspiracy. Uh, some people are stupid, yes, and some people think that they can change the world and they, they want to depopulate or whatever, but, but come on, uh, like um, Cesare, for example, uh, wants to uh, invade other nations, right? Uh, is, so this doesn't mean that this, this, there is really a risk and now there is a gang of people who are planning to invade North Korea right now at the moment. Uh, so in my opinion, um, is, is that's why for the raw food, uh, I'm gonna research it. Uh, it, it. It was interesting information shared today. Thank you so much, Megan. Uh, I believe most of it, it sounds logical. Um, and of course, it's again, a great source for readings. Uh, thank you guys. Thank you so much, Ramses. So my closing remarks are up and I'm the last to go. So uh, in response to Daniel Tweet, there is no such thing as bad bacteria. There really is, isn't. Um, all bacteria is good. And I do believe that everything in nature is essentially good um, because nature is a cycle that can't be changed. So it's better to live in line with nature than to try to change it, like Cesare had said. Now there is no evidence of any bad bacteria. Even what you mentioned in the chat, um, let's see what was the name of it again so i can get the exact name but it's the one that's in um seafood um the one that causes cholera and you know they had to find sewage was going into the drinking water to stop that and thousands tens of thousands of people died in the 1800s till they figured that out so don't right. be advocating things don't be a mass murderer here support good science please Right. Well, I'm, but there was sewage in the water, right? So it's toxins. There's the water was toxic. And so bacteria then forms as a result to consume the toxins. So that's what happens with that. Any case where bacteria is linked to an illness. Yes. Bacteria has a part to do with disease. I'm not saying disease and bacteria are unrelated, but I'm saying is that disease is formulated by toxins and then bacteria formulate or repopulate as a result to consume the cellular waste. So somebody might have toxins in their body and then they have certain uh, bacteria that multiplies to consume it. The medical industry notices the increase in bacteria and says that the bacteria is the issue when in reality they are ignoring the fundamental cause of the toxin buildup. So every single case, even going down to actually you brought up one time, um, what was it? It wasn't um, 
Oh, the Black Plague. Actually, I looked into it and it was literally black metal poisoning. That was, again, I can send you a source on that as well. So yeah, all disease does come from toxins. Bacteria is a part of cleaning that up. You said that there's no tangible body of evidence, but I look at myself as evidence. I'm, I've been eating strictly raw food for the past three months. I've been eating raw food for way longer than that, like a year, but only raw food. And I've only gotten healthier and there's 20,000 people around the world that also follow this diet and eat an abundance of bacteria are also thriving in health. Um, there's I was, not wonder... referring to that. I, was huh? I was not referring to that Megan. I was referring to the conspiracy theories that they are trying to depopulate us. Yes. I, I was answering, uh, uh Daniel's. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, no, you know, yeah, yeah, I meant, yeah, no, I, I know what you're saying. I, I feel you about the conspiracy theories, but Daniel had mentioned that there's no credible evidence to show that all bacteria is good, but I mean, uh, yeah, I haven't, the only time I actually got sick was when I ate these mussels that were farm raised and farm raised fish are given pesticides. So that happened, but there's also, yeah, 20,000 people around the world or more that follow the primal diet. And I was hoping some of them would show up today, but they didn't. So hopefully next week they can come and share their experiences. Uh, a really great book, Daniel, to read is We Want to Live by Oshinus Funder Planets. I have a PDF too I can send you. And it's really amazing. He explains it way better than myself. And yeah, he um, also another body of evidence too are the primitive peoples who also eat raw meat and um, what's it called and aren't sick or anything. So nature is the answer. Um, yeah. Okay. So that's all I have to say to that. Uh, I am really grateful for this discussion today and how open-minded everyone is. And uh, yeah, thanks for everyone for being here. And next week we are going to be doing the last and final part of the series, the raw meat diet, the healthiest diet on the planet. And that's literally what the next week one is about. That's the same title. So we're gonna actually really go into specific case studies of people who've eaten raw meat, how their health has improved and um, hopefully get to meet some other people and then more of the health benefits. And I also want to, Thank Joy for joining us. I hope that you got some value from listening to us and thanks to our listeners as well. And um, Daniel says the examples I cite are anecdotal. Yes, but the book We Want to Live is not anecdotal. It is backed by lots of research and science. Uh, Oshin's Wonder Planets was a really fascinating guy. And he's one of the only people who have uh, really done a lot of research into this. Not many other people other than Antoine Beechamp is another one, Daniel, you can look into who actually has scientific evidence about this too. So, um, last question, Cesari, how are you helping run the meeting? <laughs> no, it's like a different <laughs> <question. laughs> I'm kidding. No, Cesari, I'm grateful for Cesari. Cesari, this meeting is here because uh, Cesari has set it up, but the viewers can't see, but in the chat, Cesari asked a question and I love how Ramses always subtly attacks Cesari. And she said, this is not your meeting. And Cesari said, I'm helping her run it, but how so? Zip. He told me to zip. Okay. We can talk about that afterwards. Well, thanks again to our viewers and listeners for being here. So this idea will be in Agora in a couple of weeks, but you should totally go to Agora and check out some of the other ideas in there. And you can find that at agora-ilp.org. And actually, I forgot to do something. Show of hands, who is in agreement with this idea now? What are we agreeing to? Uh, the idea that bacteria is beneficial for us and is our best friend. Okay, so about the same as before. Uh, okay, great. You can all, for viewers and listeners, you can also find more information about our upcoming meetings. You should totally join us. And um, you can find it at citizen or facebook.com slash groups slash citizen assembly. Thank you.